A man who you've probably never heard of and who has been dead for over 20 years has been making you deeply unhappy. <laughs> now, I'm speaking figuratively, of course, but before I tell you about him, let me first tell you a little story and I'll invite you to imagine the following. Imagine that you are the head of the world's largest tobacco company and you have a problem on your hands. <laughs> now, it's not the problem you're probably thinking of. This particular problem is that you're selling cigarettes wildly well to men and women aren't buying them because they are considered unladylike. Oh, uh, did I happen to mention it's 1928? <laughs> and there's a taboo against women smoking, and particularly smoking in public. So you go to see this extraordinary genius who is seen as the go-to person who is the social engineering expert and can get this problem resolved. And so this fellow says, no problem. And he then proceeds to gather the press that covered a very famous event in New York every year, an annual event in 1928. It was then called the Macy's Easter Day Parade in New York. We know it today as the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And because of his credibility, he was able to gather the press around him for this parade because he told them, I'm going to have a new scoop for you that you got to be with me in order to get this new scoop. And they believed him. So the parade happens and he happened to also hire a group of suffragettes, women fighting for women's rights and the right to vote, to march in the parade and instructed them about what to do so what, that when they came down the parade route and were where Bernays is his name, I'll tell you more about him in a moment, was standing with the press. They all at the same time whip out cigarettes from their garters, light them up, and bam! This fellow turns to the press and says, these women are lighting torches of freedom! What do you think appeared in the newspapers the next day around the country and around the world? And in magazine advertisements, women light torches of freedom. And suddenly, torches of freedom sales to women skyrocketed. Now that, my friends, is a classic example of a social engineering strategy that was perfected by this fellow whose name was Edward Bernays. He was the father of modern public relations and a profoundly influential person from behind the scenes. And the strategy that he used to make that happen, to change public opinion, was what he called the manufacturing of consent. And what the manufacturing of consent is, is subtly manipulating people into supporting things they believe they chose themselves. That's why he was considered the father of modern public relations and he was an advisor to virtually every American president, both Democrat and Republican, from Woodrow Wilson at the end of World War I all the way through Bill Clinton and was a darling of business and media and uh, advertising agencies. And his protégés have followed in his footsteps ever since he died in 1992. That book, Propaganda, was his most well-known published book, one of a number of books of his. And if you look at this particular slide, I want you to particularly look for the phrase, the invisible government. Bernays believed in the invisible government, that the invisible government was what was the controlling factor in society. So this might sound a little bit conspiracy-esque to you, 
But believe me, this is one of those secrets hidden in plain sight because Bernays and his manufacturing of consent strategies have been well published. They've been talked about and described in books and Bernays, as I said before, published books himself. And this quote is directly out of his book, Propaganda. The ruling power of our country. The reason this is important is because at the end of World War II, Harry Truman had a little dilemma on his hands. And the dilemma was that the economy had come back from the Great Depression because of wartime. And he wanted to keep the economy growing in peacetime. So he put together a group of politicians, and business people and charged them with the responsibility of coming up with a plan for how that was going to occur. And what they hatched was called the American Dream. The 1950s version of the American Dream. And what the American Dream involved was the breadwinner of the family, if you think back to the 50s, most of the time back then, it, the breadwinner was still the man in the family, so forgive me, I don't mean to be male-centric, but just historically accurate, that the, the breadwinner, mostly the man, would be working in a job that he didn't really love, working longer and longer hours to climb the corporate ladder in order to make more and more money, working for a company he didn't necessarily agree with the values of in order to make the money that his family was going to need and his, his spouse was going to use to create the perfect consumerism lifestyle that was required according to the 1950s version of the American Dream that was going to keep the economy growing in peacetime so we're not talking conspiracy here, right? So that they could buy more things and companies were being encouraged to create demand for new products that nobody ever needed in order to keep the economy growing in peacetime as well. Well, that wasn't really quite enough. That wasn't quite enough because no matter how many hours the man worked in the job he didn't like, climbing the corporate ladder in a company that, uh, whose values he didn't necessarily agree with in order to bring home more and more money, it still wasn't enough money for getting all of this stuff. So it's no coincidence that in the 1950s, consumer debt started to skyrocket thanks to the existence for the first time in history of widely available credit cards. So we had a little conformity hazard that cropped up in the 1950s. And this is really the underpinnings of what has made us unhappy because the 1950s version of the American dream that was hatched was installed in our society using Edward Bernays' manufactured consent tactics. That version of the American dream was in complete contradiction to this country's original American dream. That original American dream had as its goal the pursuit of happiness. And in service of the pursuit of happiness was this alchemical formula, this alchemical blend of combining personal freedom and the common good. Freedom and social responsibility. Well, what the new version, the 1950s version of the American dream that still has this country and much of the world in its grips redefined the pursuit of happiness, limited the pursuit of happiness to excessive consumerism. So excessive consumerism became the new definition of happiness. Now there's nothing wrong with loving stuff and things and toys and adventures. I think all that stuff's really pretty cool. But when that becomes what I define as happiness, when that becomes the same thing as happiness, big trouble. So excessive consumerism became the new definition of what the pursuit of happiness looked like, 
And in place of personal freedom, we were going to be conforming to the script that I was just describing to you. And in place of social responsibility, in order to make that script come true, we were going to overwork. That's how the first American dream turned into the second American dream, simply because there was a noble goal of keeping the economy growing in peacetime. So, you know, over the decades that I've been a clinical and organizational development psychologist, I have assisted a lot of people who devoted themselves to that 1950s American dream and succeeded and were still unhappy despite having it all. And I've assisted leaders and businesses who got in trouble, who got stuck because they bought into the belief that they needed to sacrifice personal integrity and social responsibility in order to be profitable. And my mission, and I hope your mission by the time this talk is over, is to make happiness sustainable and integrity profitable. So specifically, what can we do? Well, I'm going to give you a starting place for some of the things that we can do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's kind of the tip of the iceberg, and partly because of doing this TED Talk, I've decided that, uh, that this whole theme is going to be the, uh, the theme of the next book I'm going to be writing. Um, and the first, the first thing that we can do is to just jump out of the 1950s version of the American dream, the version that replaced the pursuit of happiness, of true sustainable happiness with this very limited, dif dif limited definition of happiness as excessive consumerism. And why is this important? Because when we are taken in by the dynamics of manufactured consent, when we're manipulated in the sort of way that I described as the classic example of manufactured consent, we are taken under a spell. We're brought under a spell. And that spell, like in fairy tales, you all, you all know spells in fairy tales, right? And the spell that we're brought under, we only get stuck and stay in a spell as long as we don't know we're under one and we don't know how to name it. The moment we know we're under a spell and we know how to name it, we are free of the spell. So the spell is the 1950s American nightmare. And so the theme of this TED event, of course, is just jump out and uh, just jump in rather. And I am going to be inviting you in a moment to just jump into some things. But first, I want to invite you to just jump out of the 1950s version of the American dream. Are you ready to do that? Can I hear a yes? Yeah. Awesome. Second thing is to just jump into fact checking because that is the antidote to manufactured consent. You know, we live in an internet age and a social networking age where the amount of stuff that gets passed around as though it's fact is overwhelming. I mean, what usually, what passes as fact is usually spin. And the good news, though, is that because of the internet age, we also have fact-checking capabilities, fact-checking resources on the internet at our disposal that enable us to bow out of having our opinions manipulated. So, are you ready to step into fact-checking? Can I hear a yes? yes? Good. That's the antidote to manufactured consent. The third piece is vote integrity over party. 
meaning that when we're voting, if we vote as had in recent past happened in San Diego, we voted uh, in the city of San Diego for somebody to become mayor who, uh, who put, uh, well, let's just simply say he, he brought integrity to new lows. Um, and, and he's just one, the, one poster child of, in the news cycle. There's, there's always the next and the next and the next politician. So regardless of our political orientation, when we vote in favor of integrity, we are sending a message to both political parties and to all candidates that says the public insists on integrity no matter what their political orientation is. Are you willing to vote integrity? Yes. yes. The fourth is apply fact checking to purchases as well. Fact checking your purchases is where we're voting also with our wallets. Every time we buy something. And we can vet, thanks to the internet, we can vet the integrity of companies. We can, inv we can vet the, uh, the claims that they're making about the products and services that they're selling. And when we, when we vote with our wallet in favor of companies that have integrity and are socially responsible, we are jumping out of the lie of the 1950s version of the American Dream. So are you willing to vote with your wallet? Can I hear a yes? yes. yes. So let me leave you with this. You know, Martin Luther King, his famous speech was, I have a dream. Well, I'm going to borrow that because I have a dream too. I have a dream that individually each one of us will stop being manipulated by manufactured consent so that together we can restore sustainable happiness and make integrity profitable. I hope you'll join me.